I am picking up just where uh, Sylvia left off, basically, um, where Sylvia went through uh, sort of start to finish, how do you do a neuropixels recording from getting the probe out of the box to putting it in the brain and taking it out and cleaning it. Um, I am going to sort of give further practical details. In some sense, the relationship here is that I'm going to give like other options for ways that you could do things or, or options for if you need to have different experimental requirements um, or sort of advanced techniques, I guess. Um, so I currently, let's see if I can bring up, I currently can't see, in my, when I'm in presenter view here, I can't see the Q&A um, uh, at all. So, so you know, Sylvia and Matteo, just, just interrupt me if I should answer any questions. Um, okay. Speaking. Um, okay, great. So, um, so there was a question. Oh, so, sorry, then maybe I would just want to remind people, if you have a question that you think is on topical on a slide, and you want to get the answer right away, raise your hand and otherwise type it in the Q&A. Yeah, I think the whole of today is going to be um, best as a, as a, a, a some kind of a discussion. Um, so we'll, we should try that and see how it goes. Okay. Okay, so um, we had a question about gain settings um, yesterday. Um, Carolina mentioned that there were gain settings, and and someone asked uh, when should you use different gain settings. So here's the here's the table that gives um, what you should understand the gain settings to mean. So a, a gain number is a number that's going to multiply the voltage values that are being recorded before they get digitized, which means that if you have a high gain, you multiply very small voltages by a lot, and they become very big voltages before they become digitized. So as you can imagine, that means you have very high resolution. Um, the, the resolution number is small, meaning that, that um, you have high resolution. You have um, a very uh, detailed encoding of the voltage when it's been multiplied by a lot. But it means that your range of voltages that you can encode without going outside of the range of the, of the um, ADC, the digital converter, um, is going to be small. And so that's the fundamental trade-off. So if you think that your signals will fit into this really tiny range, then you would be benefited by using this high gain because you will get the higher voltage resolution. Um, but if you think that your signals will instead be larger than this range, then you uh, need to choose a smaller gain um, so that you can have more range because otherwise you'll just saturate the amplifiers and you will uh, not record anything for the time that it's outside of the range. Hope that makes sense. So the default on the probes is going to be this gain of 500. Um, that gives you 1 point, minus 1 1.2 to 1.2 millivolts. Most places in the brain, um, you do not find 1.2 millivolt spikes. It is possible that you could be recording somewhere where there's spikes that are 1.2 millivolts. Um, for instance, maybe if you're in the olfactory bulb, you might find such spikes. Um, in which case you would need to, you would you would observe that there's saturations and you need to choose a lower gain setting for your recordings in that area. Um, but the default I think really pretty much works everywhere. And keep in mind that this is not uh, or this is yeah separately talking about the um, action potential or high frequency band versus the LFP or low frequency band. Um, and so this is not uh, the limit of the range of um, of uh, LFP fluctuations that you can record if you set the gain of 500 on the AP band. And you can indeed set them different, and 250 is the more common gain, or I think even the default gain for the uh, LFP band, um, recognizing that the LFP fluctuations are usually larger. Nick, we have a question here. Yep. Asking, can the gain set independently for each channel? Actually, it can. Um, I've never done that because, yeah. But yes, it, actually, it can. So uh, the way you do it is, um, when you're so if you're in spike glx for instance i'll talk more about software um, later in the options but if you're in spike glx which is the one that, that all of us here have experience oh actually andy has um, open phys experience so maybe he can talk to this but um, in spike glx in any case you're gonna um, right click on the um, traces in the in the gui and click set channel gains um, and it'll just let you um, it'll come up with a big table where you can set a different gain for every channel if you want i'm not sure if there's a way to like super quickly and easily do it but it's possible. Any other pressing questions? Um, there's okay. one. Can yep. you change gains on groups? Sorry, <laughs> gains on groups of channels differentially. Yeah, I mean, so same answer. Yeah, you you can set every channel independently. You can set a group of channels to be something. Um, yeah, 
And I think that what you're going to find is that, yeah, yeah, it would be interesting. So let me just say it would be interesting um, if someone did a detailed comparison of how much better spike sorting is when you have a 2.34 microvolt per bit resolution versus a 4.69 microvolt per bit resolution. I don't know of anyone who has done such a comparison. Um, the fact is that most of the neurons that you can spike sort are much larger amplitudes than this resolution anyway, which means you're already pretty, you know, not really limited by this resolution, I think. Um, and so I don't think you should stress out about like trying to really push the gain as high as humanly possible given your range. I think you should start with going for the defaults, um, do your recordings like that. If you think that something can be improved, then then go for this. Again, today's thing is all, all about like details basically. Anything else, Sylvie? Yeah, one more. Would gain affect signal noise ratio? I think maybe you said this. Yeah, in principle, yes. Um, in principle, the higher gain you use, the better um, the better your signal is going to be because you um, have a have a better resolution on your encoding. Um, but like right. I said, I don't know of a quantitative comparison. Okay, so um, we've been talking about the AP band and the LFP band, um, and I just wanted to show that the um, cutoff uh, filters for the AP and LFP band, um, and there's these aren't settable on the probe. Um, you just get low frequency below 500 hertz, high frequency above 300 hertz. But um, but uh, the main reason that I wanted to say have a slide about the filters is to point out that um, even though it's filtering the LFP, the low frequency and the high frequency into different bands, these filters are um, what's called first order, um, basically meaning that they are not strong filters. Um, and this is just to, to conserve space on the probes because they didn't need to be. Um, so they're not as strong of a filter as you would do in um, software, for instance, or, or if you were building something that was specifically trying to exclude everything below a certain frequency range. Um, the consequence of this is that you frequently will look at your LFP band traces where you see LFP and you'll see spikes in it. Um, and you also frequently will look at your AP band trace and you'll see like slower wheels that um, correspond to things that you, people would normally call LFP. Um, like sharp wave ripples, even especially, especially sharp wave ripples, but even you know gamma or other things, um, and you'll think, wow, these filters, um, you know, like why why would I be seeing spikes in my LFP? Um, so the answer is just that the filters are weak. Um, you should then do your own filtering post hoc to produce what you consider to be LFP or what you are interested in studying in the LFP that then would exclude spiking um, data. Okay. Um, referencing options. So Carolina obviously gave um, a really great um, discussion and then Sylvia followed it up with still further details on this. So I'm not going to talk at great length about referencing. Um, you already heard about it. Um, I do have just a couple things to say about it. So one is that um, I have had success recently, um, something you can try um, with using uh, the internal reference mode, specifically the tip reference. And I, I'm not sure if Carolina made it clear, but just don't use these guys. They're not going to work well. Um, but you can use internal reference with the tip mode. And I've had success recently with um, inserting the probe with no, um, uh, no uh, wires connected between the ground and reference pads and the mouse in any way. So um, literally just leaving the ground um, sort of floating, um, which as Carolina described is not an optimal thing. It can result in the mouse like being out of um, register with the range of the amplifiers. Um, but I've had success doing that. It has not seemed to cause any problem in my particular um, setup, which makes for a much easier setup because A, you don't have to do any soldering and B, you don't have to connect any wire around to the mouse. So it could be worth trying that out um, before you start to get into the soldering. Um, the way that prep works is you do a craniotomy, you wanna put um, dura gel onto the craniotomy um, or you could use a saline bath, but that you can you can skip the saline bath with this approach also. So you would do the craniotomy, put, put dura gel on the craniotomy, which is penetratable by the probe, but will keep the dura um, clean and moist. Um, and then just stick the probe in. And, and um, I've been having good success with such recordings. Um, the only minor detail I would add about that is that when you first put the probe in, like you're this deep into the brain, um, it's going to look like you have a lot of noise. Um, and so you have to stick with it, get the whole array in, and then somehow magically it no longer looks like there's a lot of noise. Um, 
So give it a try if you want to, um, if you're really super scared of the soldering. Otherwise, uh, dive in and learn the soldering. Those are your options. Uh, Nick, we have <laughs> yeah. another question yeah. um, by Dory. Dory, you can speak, I think. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering, how does this um, sort of interact with other types of sort of noise reduction that you do around your rig? Like, um, can you keep your ground? Like, would you need like, uh, uh, you obviously need a Faraday gauge, I presume? You don't. So actually, this is my next slide is about denoising and oh, grounding. Okay. So let me, yeah, and, and one of my bullet points is on this. So let me go ahead and jump into that. And then we'll come back to you, Dory, if, if, uh, if I don't address it. Um, Okay, so I, I do have this slide about denoising and grounding. So um, obviously, uh, anybody who's done electrophysiology before knows that noise sources in electrophysiology rigs are, are um, fickle and complex and difficult to work out, even for someone who's an expert. Um, you know, I've never met someone who can like look at the noise signature and just be like, and look at the rig and then be like, you just connect this to this and everything will be solved. Um, it just doesn't work like that. So you have to have basically troubleshooting steps that you walk through to figure out for your particular rig um, what's going on. So um, first of all, let me just say, if you're doing a saline test, um, there is in the user manual a, a sort of detailed description and picture of how, how they would like you to set up um, the saline test. Um, so that's that's useful to, to just sort of check that you're doing things by the book according to the user manual. Um, Something I'm not sure anybody has mentioned yet. Um, there are these, um, what are called BIST. Uh, I should have looked up what BIST stands for. T is for test. It's some kind of tests that run um, on the probe um, to check different aspects of the probe functioning. Um, so if you have some noise, probably one of the first things I would try is just run these BIST. They, they run in software, it's a software option. You click run BST, BIST. Um, and it runs these tests, it takes like three minutes, um, and then it gives you a little report of nine different tests, what, what their outcome is. Um, and in Spike GLX software, um, when you run these, you get this little text report. Um, the text report is a bit hard to interpret. Oh, built-in self-test, thank you, yes. Um, the, uh, the text report is a little hard to interpret, but there's a little like help button that looks like a question mark. You click it and it gives you a, a detailed description of what the different outcomes of the tests might indicate. Um, specifically, if you're having noise problems and you run this, um, you will fail the last test, which is called noise level, um, because literally what that test is doing is just taking in a data stream for a bit and computing the noise levels and making sure they're in the range that they're supposed to be in. And if you're having noise, they're going to be outside the range. Um, but you shouldn't fail the other tests. Um, so if all the other tests pass and the only thing that's wrong is the noise level, then that's a reasonable indication that your probe is in a good state. And what you need to solve is the situation around the probe, uh, something about grounding, something about um, the way you've connected up the referencing, et cetera, um, and that it's not the probe's fault. Um, and I guess while I'm on the to topic of the built-in and self-tests, um, uh, I'll just mention the one other really common result that, that I get on the built-in self-test, um, which is something where it produces no lock, and it'll produce that for like all of the tests. Um, and what that means, or many of the tests, I guess, the first one is maybe the base station or something. So what that means is that you just aren't connected with the probe. Um, why it doesn't say no connection, uh, or, but anyway, what you do is you just reconnect at the head stage. So Sylvia mentioned this yesterday. You, you pull out the flex cable from the head stage, put it in again, flip down the connector again, try again. Um, and some of the head stages and even some of the probe head stage combinations <laughs> can be really tricky to get to connect. Um, but no lock means that connection is almost certainly means that that particular connection is not working. And so you just either need to keep trying with that, that head stage and probe, get a different head stage. Um, if it's your first time with anything and you're not sure about whether your system works, maybe try a different probe. Um, but basically, once you get that connection working, you'll stop getting the no lock here. OK, that was a bit Nick, of a have... Yeah. A couple of questions. Um, is the BIST something you run regularly or only when a problem occurs? Only when a problem occurs, yeah. Um, yeah, once, yeah, I mean, so I think we had the question yesterday about like how often can you reuse a probe? The answer is pretty much until you break it. We don't really observe any signal quality degradation. And so more or less my day to day would be, you know, plugging in the probe, seeing that the, the traces just while it's in the air look the same as they did yesterday and not running any further tests, but assuming it's going to work fine when I put it in the brain. Um, so unless I see something otherwise. Okay. 
And on the topic of uh, grounding, is there a difference between having a reference go to a screw or having the reference go into a saline bath? Um, uh, I'm sure there could be a difference, but there, those two approaches are trying to achieve the same thing, right? They're trying to um, have a, a uh, relatively low impedance connection between that wire and the interior of the, of the skull. So um, they, should, they should achieve about the same thing. Great, thanks. Um, okay, um, so just back to denoising and going through um, some, some other steps that you should try if you're seeing noise. Um, so power down and, okay, by the way, actually, before I go on, um, I will talk a bit about the Spike GLX GUI um, in a few slides. And at that point, I will mention um, how to, to see the amplitude of the noise um, and what number you should be looking for there to make sure that it's not too noisy. So in other words, what does too noisy mean? Okay, but basically, um, sorry, I should have put that first, but basically um, we'll assume your things look too noisy. Okay, so um, next step is start powering down and unplugging things. Um, so like if there's, um, you know, some, some um, device in your rig that's like uh, got a power supply and is producing like, I don't know, it's speakers or it's, it's uh, um, a, a water bath or like some, some random device you have around the rig, power it down. And often it even helps to unplug it, even if it's powered down, because a lot of times these devices will still draw power for, for like internal um, I've literally seen this be the source of noise is like some device that was powered off, but still plugged in when you unplugged it, the noise went away. So just, um, it's annoying, but that can be a thing, to, helpful thing to try. Um, turn off lights. We'll hear tomorrow about um, the fact that there are light artifacts on these probes. Um, usually room lights are not enough to produce any detectable lights, but depending on the light, depending on the rate at which it's flickering, et cetera, you could get something from lights. Um, so in other words, just start powering down everything that you can aside from your system and um, hopefully um, you'll identify that, you know, one of these things uh, needed to be powered down. Um, double check your soldering and referencing. Uh, Bill Karsh, um, who's the Genelia guy who does a lot of tech support for NeuroPixels probes, you'll probably end up talking to him at some point if you have problems. Um, he, he says that most of the problems he sees are because people have not done a good job and they have a crappy soldering and referencing joint. So in Sylvia's slides yesterday emphasized, you know, how easy it is to get that wrong. Um, so just double check that, make the connect, make sure the connection is good, use a multimeter, check everything. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would suggest, so I think yesterday we had the point that, um, that uh, you know, Carolina was sort of laying out the, the ideal way to connect up your referencing and your grounding. Um, and you should definitely go for that. Um, I think the point, however, is that all situations are going to be a little different and just trying different configurations is going to be a useful thing to try. And if you, for instance, you know, connect up um, your external reference um, and you connect it to your ground and you connect it to a saline bath, you can try a bunch of different com configurations really quickly. You can switch to internal reference mode in software. You can um, pull the, the wire out of the saline bath and keep it on internal reference mode. You can disconnect the external reference from the ground um, and try that configuration, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different configurations that you can sort of quickly try through and see how they affect the noise. Um, okay, so Dory's question was about shielding and Faraday cages. Actually, in fact, um, I think these things are pretty unlikely to help. Um, and that's because as soon as the signals um, come off of the shank and into the base, they get digitized right there. Um, and so Sylvia mentioned this point yesterday, the signals are digital all along this really long cable. Um, and, and there's just, there's basically, I mean, you, it, it's possible in principle to have a source of electromagnetic interference that, um, that breaks those digital signals. Um, but the kind of error you will see will not be a corruption of the signal, will not be noise, it'll be like loss of signal or something like that. Um, so, so really, um, I think you know, putting putting your copper mesh or your aluminum foil everywhere is is pretty unlikely to to be the solution. I mean, I can't tell you what the solution is going to be, so go for it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think that's not where I would spend my efforts. Um, any other, actually, you know, Sylvia, Andy, Julie, any other, um, or Mateo for that matter, any other thoughts, suggestions of things to try that you guys would suggest um, to people? No, um, I'm not sure if you 
said it here, but one of the things that I've seen very commonly is that um, the head plate will be, so the head plate will be metal and then the metal head plate will be in contact with the saline. And then that often forms a ground loop. It's like 80% of the time there's tons of noise. That's, that's the reason. Yes, uh, the good. Other, okay. I forgot I had a slide on. Well, the yeah, 15% of the other time is because like, if there's another piece of metal that's actually accidentally touching. So like, for example, we have a metal pole that holds our ground wire and occasionally that metal pole will just barely be touching the metal of the head plate holder or something. And so those two situations account for like 95% of the issues that I've seen. Great. Yeah. Okay. So I, I actually, yeah, good. Excellent. I agree completely. And um, I forgot I had made this little diagram to sort of illustrate exactly what Andy is talking about or attempt to. Um, so Andy, you tell me if this is what you had in mind. So um, here's our mouse. Here's a head plate. Um, the head plate, um, as Andy said, is metal. And um, as Andy said, what we try to do is to isolate the saline bath um, and whatever else is around your implant, isolate it from the metal so that this metal is not uh, connected uh, to, to the recording in any way. Um, isolate it from the internal fluids of the mouse. Like you want it to sort of encased in cement so that it's just not in contact with the mouse basically. Um, and so then if you don't do that, the problem is that you can have this situation where you've got your probe plugged in, you've got the wire coming down into the bath um, and you have then a path to, to ground um, via the, the cable and the uh, recording system. But you also have another path to ground which is that the saline is in contact with the um, with the uh, head, head plate, goes via the uh, metal head plate holder, for instance, to the table, and the table has its own um, path to ground. And um, in fact, you know, it could be the case that this doesn't cause a problem if these two grounds are sort of at the same spot. Um, but if they're not, and um, what does it mean that they're not, um, then it can cause, cause a problem. What it means is that, um, the actual place where those two grounds physically come together is somewhere literally physically far away. So it's often the case that if you plug into one wall outlet and another wall outlet, even if they're relatively close to each other on the wall, that their actual electrical circuitry in the building um, goes sort of different directions and only reconverges into a common ground um, somewhere many meters away, right? Um, and so the reason, so in that case, like if you happen to have that kind of weird situation, you can get what Andy referred to as a ground loop where there's actually current that flows um, just around this big loop because ultimately this ground and this ground are connected to each other. They are, they are um, shared, but via a very, very long um, path. And if that path is long enough, you'll actually get current flowing around that loop and that's going to be a big noise source. Um, so like one of the, yeah, one, one time I had this problem, um, at my, my rig because the, the table was grounded to like a special grounding port. Um, and that grounding port, I guess, went directly to building ground, which then was like a different ground than all of the other electronics went to and created ground loops. And just ungrounding the table from the building ground was, was a way to solve that problem. Um, so yeah, isolating, isolating the implant from any metal, anything metal, I think is the, is the best first, uh, way to go as, as Andy suggested. Thanks. All right, there are several questions about grounding. Um, one is what metal do you use for your head plates? Titanium? Uh, I think we've used both titanium and steel. Um, yeah, okay. Um, then maybe you said it, but maybe you can clarify, where do you ground to? To a general wall power outlet or is there a place you can plug in a ground in the NI box? Um, yeah, the NI box, you know, will be itself grounded to the wall via its power cable. Um, um, yeah, the, 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 main, the main goal here is to have everything, everything on your rig that, um, can be grounded, all connected to one single ground plane um, is what it's referred to. So like the surface of your air table um, is a good one. You just ground everything to that air table and then it will all share a ground that's not far away. Um, and and that'll be the, the correct configuration. Um, Nick, there's a question from Simon um, and I'm gonna click answer live. Um, Simon asks if there's a benefit to building a Faraday cage. I'm not sure this got addressed. 
we might differ in our opinions of this. I think there isn't, but what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's so I, I think uh, I've seen plenty of rigs with no Faraday cage that work just fine with their pixels. Um, I think it's definitely possible to have some kind of interference. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's impossible to have a use for a Faraday cage um, just because the electrical wiring behind the walls of buildings is so variable and so unpredictable. Um, but I think I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't uh, bet that you need it or spend a lot of time building one as your first option for how to, <laughs> how to, uh, yeah, yeah, neither, neither shielding the probe nor shielding your whole rig um, is likely to be a, a huge contribution. All right, one more. Where do you place the ground in the head? Is there a preferred place? No, uh, you know, classically people have like used cerebellum if they're recording from cortex or used cortex if they're recording from cerebellum or something like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're putting in a screw, you can put it just somewhere distant from where you're recording. Um, if you're using a saline bath, we, we just, you know, put it over the whole surface of, of the dorsal aspect of the mouse skull, basically. And there's one last question. I'm not sure I understand myself. <laughs> I give you a go. Follow up to Andy's point. If I use stainless steel wells, which option is better? Switch to some kind of plastic or grounding the well to the NPX chassis, maybe? Hey, yeah. So one yeah. option, if you do that, is to coat it in dental cement. Um, so like we use metal head plates. But as long as there's dental cement separating the metal from the saline, then you're fine. So if you go with that option, that's probably the easiest thing I'd recommend. Sounds good. Cool. And OK, this is about several probes. When recording from two or more probes, is it recommended to connect the two ground wires to the same side on the animal's head? How about the two reference wires? So the configuration that I've used when we re when recording from two or more probes is that on each probe ground is shorted to reference, which is the configuration that, as Carolina described, is not uh, IMEX recommended configuration, but is the one that uh, we use and, and I know many other people use as well. Um, so if you have ground connected to reference, um, which is sort of what's shown with this little loop here, um, on every probe, then you just have one wire coming off of the probe, which is both ground and reference those wires all need to meet at some place and it does not have to be at the head right it can be somewhere over here but then and then you just have one silver wire coming into the head um and so the ground and reference then on every single probe is all shared um and that has worked for me um i've also heard other people complain that they have noise introduced by the second probe being there again these things i don't know if there's ever an easy way to say exactly what the problem is going to be Great, I think that's it. And let us know if you can't take questions anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's let's just let me just check what time it is and what. Time There's a tip from Maxime in the in the chat. Uh -huh. He says another piece of advice is to use a power surge protective battery pack between your ground wire and the wall ground, as the ground from your building might be dirty, prone to interference. Hmm. Um, yeah, there is. Okay. Okay. Great suggestion. Yeah, there is a place um, on the, so this is this picture, and sorry, I'll go back to the last slide. Um, there's a place on the iMac card that, uh, you know, hosts the probe um, that allows you to use a battery power supply for the whole probe system rather than the wall power supply. Um, it's right here. Um, so yeah, I haven't tried that, but um, great suggestion. That could, that could definitely be um, a thing to do if the building supply is your problem. Incidentally, uh, the probes are not made for use in humans, and you should not put them in humans. However, should you want to break the law, which you shouldn't, and put them in humans, you certainly wouldn't want them attached to the mains. You certainly would want them attached to a battery. But you're not going to put them in humans, because it's not allowed. I hope okay. that makes sense. Um, so I just wanted to return to the issue of uh, site selection, um, which did come up yesterday, but I want to just say slightly more about it. Um, so, you know, Carolina described um, how this works. You know, you have um, electrode one um, and electrode 385 um, and electrode 769 all share a single channel. So sites one, 385, 769 all share channel zero, um, which means that um, 
you can only record from one of those three at a time. Um, and then and then marching up the pro to 386, 770 are all shared. Okay, so Carolyn, you described that. And I just wanted to point out um, the consequence of this system. What are some of the useful um, site selections that you can do? So one is that you can pick any contiguous block of 384 channels. So this blue block here is supposed to represent 384 channels um, and that, that, sorry, 384, let's say sites that I've con connected to on the probe. And I can move that up by any arbitrary number of channels. So um, any contiguous block of 384. Why is that? Well, you can imagine I take um, sites uh, one and two down here and they're normally channel zero and one, but now I instead connect channel zero and one to 385, 386. I've still got a block of 3D um, four consecutive channels, uh, consecutive sites, but it's moved up by a pair of sites. And then I can do that with the next pair of sites. And now I still have 384, but it's moved up by two pairs of sites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's one. You can get any contiguous block of 384 channels. Two is, um, two and three are two ways that you can split the channels um, to get double the length, but half the density. Um, so now I'm indicating with the purple and yellow, the even and odd sites. So the even sites um, are over here on this side of the probe, the odd sites are over here on this side of the probe. Um, and if you had just simply remap all of the odd sites, say, um, from bank zero, the deepest um, site they can connect to, all the way up to bank, bank one, then that will move, in this case, you know, the purple ones up to the next bank. And then I've got twice the length, so 7.7 .7 millimeters rather than 3.8 millimeters, um, but half the density, only one site every 20 microns rather than two sites every 20 microns. And another sort of um, similar scheme that you can do to achieve that is to think of the um, think of the sites in groups of four, say, um, or eight, or something like that. Um, so little blocks of sites where I then move four of them up to the next bank um, and keep the next four down here, and then move four of them up to the next bank and keep the next four down here. And that's going to result in this sort of um, tetrodes with little gaps kind of arrangement all the way up the um, all the way up the, the shank. So those are two ways that you can double your recording span um, at half the density. And there's no, you know, th th neither of these solutions is perfect, obviously, for getting double the recording span because you're simply not recording half of the channels, uh, half, of, half of the sites, meaning that you literally will just lose uh, neurons that were present on those spikes. Uh, but you can gain the ability to record across 7.7 .7 millimeters. So it could be worth it, depending on your goals. Any, any questions about that? No. Okay, great. Um, so synchronization. So um, there's two ways. So synchronization, what I mean is, um, how do I uh, do an experiment where I now know um, what time the events that happened outside of uh, my recording um, occurred relative to the recording? Um, so there's pretty much two ways you can do it. Um, one is you can use this calibration procedure that um, Bill Karsh has built into Spike GLX where um, you run a thing, it like spends a while sort of talking with the probe, and then it tells you, great, you're done. Um, the the timestamps from your probe and the timestamps from, from another card that you have in the PXI chassis, which for instance is like an NI data acquisition card, now those timestamps will be synchronized. Um, uh, how he gets to that is by basically trying to make a very careful measurement of the of the sampling rates of the different devices and then apply that calibrated measurement um, to the data traces. Um, personally, um, that for me is is too much uh, faith um, in that process and in, in the idea that like the, the sample rates are then gonna stay constant over time after that point or something like that. Um, so the second method, which is the one that I have used, um, is a different one and requires no faith, um, which I like about it. Um, it's to send a digital signal into the probe data stream and into um, your other data acquisition devices. Um, so there's a little port here, it's an SMA port. You can get a little SMA to BNC connector, for instance, and connect any any digital signal that's coming off of a, B, off of a BNC onto here. Um, so you can connect up a digital line there um, and when you do, anytime that digital line goes up or down, um, you will get, you will see that signal um, on the very last channel of your recording. And so 
it will be recorded right alongside your data. You know exactly which sample the digital signal went up and which sample the digital signal went down. And then you send that same digital signal to any other data acquisition devices that you have. Okay. Um, so the um, way that you use that then, uh, I'm going to try to describe this um, briefly because I think it's like, it's not too complex of a concept, but it definitely take, took me and takes people um, a few minutes to wrap their head around. So I kind of wanted to get it on the slide so that you can see it, um, even if I don't have time to um, to make it make sense necessarily to everyone. So the way that, the way that it works is you detect the times of these digital events in both data files. Um, you have the data file of the probe and you have the data file of your other acquisition device. Um, and you get the times of these same digital events that are on both systems. And then you convert times of other events on that acquisition system into um, times that are aligned to the probe. And that's a one line in, in MATLAB, which is an interpolation. So let me just be more clear here. So I have an, another acquisition system and let me give a concrete example. It's getting these digital signals, which are used for synchronization. Um, but it's also getting, say, the times that camera frames were triggered. Um, so it's now got these times that camera frames are triggered. And I want to know when did the camera frames happen relative to my um, neuropixels recording. So I have the original times, which is the times of the camera frames in the other acquisition system. I have the times of the synchronization events in the other acquisition system. And I have the times of the synchronization events in the neuropixel system. And I want to get out the um, aligned times, that is the times of the camera events um, in the neuropixel system. And it's this one line, um, which you can do. And the picture you should have in mind is like this. You have the measurement, sorry for the noise in the background, but we have the construction site across the uh, way here. Um, you have this uh, uh, picture in your head of the times that you measured the synchronization events in red here in the one system and the other system. And, your, um, and the times that you measured, say, that camera trigger in the other system. And you want to know when it happened in your neuropixel system. And that's an interpolation uh, between times when you measured that synchronization event uh, to get the time when that um, event occurred. And so you can see why this is um, this requires no trust or anything. You're just literally um, just measuring and interpolating, interpolating between the times when you know these shared events happened. Um, I guess I'll take any questions on that, um, but I, I really wanted to put this line of code and this picture here um, for you to look at later when you're trying to work this out if you if you go this route. We have no questions about synchronization as far as I can see, but actually uh, to be four about the configurations. Is that okay? Okay. Yep. Um, do you ever alternate sites during a recording to get the highest within session yield of cells at different time points? Um, so there was just a paper that came up on BioArchive from, from Bijan Pesaran's lab, um, giving an algorithm to do that. I, I really, because the mapping is so constrained, right, each channel can only have a couple of different uh, electrodes. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that most people's scenarios are going to be usefully impacted by such a strategy. I think in, in the Pesaran lab, they're recording from like, you know, a 10 millimeter in monkeys, a 10 millimeter long span of sort of uninterrupted scattered cells. And then, then maybe that's the situation in which sort of like trying to have an algorithmic um, spread of them is useful. But I think in, certainly in mouse, and I think in most cases, even in monkeys, I, I wouldn't think that that's going to be a particularly useful strategy. Hmm. Um, will you explain later how to do the different configurations in Spike GLX? Um, yeah, roughly. I mean, yeah, it's just, you just, uh, well, I guess not specifically. I mean, it's, it's you load a configuration file, and, and there's a set of configuration files that are provided, um, and there's some code that you can make new ones if you have a particularly desired configuration. Um, it's you'll have to consult the documentation. It's pretty easy though. Um, yeah. Um, there's one more. I wonder how much the low density configuration, even odd channel assignment, will decrease the unmixing efficiency as the more local recording site, the better the BC, PCA, ICA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the spike sorting will be better if you have the highest possible density of sites. That is for sure the case. Um, yeah, and I agree, uh, you know, it's a pretty simple test that um, I haven't seen done um, to just take a recording where you had double the sites, throw out half the sites and see how much worse your spec sorting gets on the neurons that are left. 
Um, definitely doable. I haven't done it. Okay, then I think we do you have time? Yeah, uh, probably. Yep. Uh, I think this is about synchronization now. Just to make okay. it clear, the time error you modify is the one from other devices. I think maybe just yeah, explain again. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not modifying anything. All I want to know is what time did these say camera frames happen in in the time base, um, the coordinates of of the um, probe recording, so that I can compare them to my spike times, right? Or so that I can compute the spike triggered average or the frame triggered average. Um, so I'm just taking the measure, the three three times I measured the synchronization synchronization events in one system, the neuropixel system, and then the the times I'm interested in from the other system. Those things I measured, and I'm producing a new array, which is the uh, the times in in neuropixels coordinates of those events I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And for synchronization, what do you use to generate the digital signal? Yeah, good question. So um, what I use is um, a little Arduino that's just programmed to output a digital signal that goes up and down with somewhat randomized timing intervals. Um, kind of, kind of like I showed here. Sometimes it's a short interval between digital events, and sometimes it's a long interval, just to um, just to to make it so that there's no ambiguity um, about which events go with which events. Um, at Allen Institute, they have a similar system that's even more sophisticated. It like sends out sequences of pulses that encode the time of day <laughs> at which the pulses were sent out and all this. Um, so it's again, like just reducing amb ambiguity, but even just um, some clock pulse that goes up and down every second or something like that can work um, as long as you're sure that you'll get exactly all of the um, events of that clock pulse on one system and on the other system, then you're, go you're golden, that's all you need. Yeah. You, you can use the camera frames. Um, you can pick one of your, I think what IBL does is you pick one of your real events and send it into both systems. And then you use that one real event, like a camera frame time, um, for for aligning any other events that you have. Uh, that's also a valid solution. OK, let's go on. So um, sharpening. So this was brought up before a couple of times now. Um, the idea is the following. This is a, a the SEM photo of um, NeuroPixels probe that uh, Mateo showed you yesterday. Um, and what you can notice for this purpose of this discussion is that the probe has some thickness. It's about 20 microns, 24 microns, I think. Um, and the part of the probe that enters the brain is this line, right? And so you can imagine that um, the as you push down on the dura, um, the pressure that you generate at each point on the dura is going to be much, much smaller um, than if you had just a point here rather than a line. Uh, because you're sort of distributing the pressure along the whole line. And so if you want to puncture the dura more effectively, it would be beneficial to have a point here rather than a line. Um, they have designed the probes such that if you cut away um, a sort of like angled segment here, such that indeed this comes to a point, that you will not damage the probe. So um, you can cut away, I think, up to a pretty shallow angle and, and you will not damage the probe. Um, so the exact protocol is on, there's a link up for the protocol on the wiki, um, 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 which you can read. It's pretty detailed. Um, I think it's pretty easy to do. Um, and I have a couple of photos here. Uh, these photos uh, are actually different than the ones on the wiki because these came from the Cortex Lab um, setup of this. Uh, so thanks, thanks Cortex Lab for um, providing these photos. Uh, really cool that you were able to set it up too. Um, so basically you just, uh, hold the probe over a little um, grinder. And this is a like sort of super classic, like this device was probably designed in like 1963 or something. This is a, um, a micro pipette grinder. Um, and uh, you just touch the tip of the probe down to the micro pipette grinder while it's spinning and you will grind off um, an angled um, cut of the probe. Uh, that's it. Uh, it's really that simple. Um, this device spins really quite slowly and it takes about 15 minutes to do this cutting. So you sort of like touch it down, have it spinning, and you walk away and then come back. Um, and I think that makes it really a safe procedure. We've so far not broken one, at least in my hands, um, in my lab. Uh, we have not broken one. I don't know if Cortex Lab has broken one yet, but um, I think I think you it's hard to break one this way. Um, by contrast, uh, the, the older system that Andy mentioned, um, where you take actually a spinning hard drive, which then spins at an incredibly fast rate, 
that was the system that um, Genelio was using. And as I described on the wiki, um, we, we did break a probe trying that at, uh, at UW. Uh, I don't really recommend it. It's kind of insane. Um, it apparently works for them in Genelia, but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. So check out the wiki if you want to try sharpening your probes. Uh, I guess maybe it's worth saying that um, it's definitely the case that this will be easier to get into Dura. Um, and so if you have some tough spot of Dura that you're trying, that you are usually trying to aim for, or you've been having difficulty getting through Dura, whatever it is, um, definitely this will help for, with that. It can't hurt. Um, there is a difference of opinion. Some people think that uh, whereas some shape of tip, like for instance, maybe this one, um, might be good at uh, pushing aside blood vessels. A sharp tip might instead do more puncturing of blood vessels um, and therefore result in more bleeding. Um, there's definitely no evidence I'm aware of about this one way or the other. Um, so yeah, uh, just wanted to share that, that some people have that opinion. And so it might be worth, some, worth thinking about if you are um, especially concerned about it. Um, but I, th I think it's I think it's good to go for it. Uh, I don't really quite share the intuition about the bleeding and and uh, haven't noticed any worse quality of recordings um, since I've been using this. Any questions? Uh, there's one question. Is the micro pipette grinding device available to purchase somewhere? Yeah, there's there's links and part numbers and stuff um, at, the, at that wiki particle. Um, it, it's not yeah, it's not super cheap, but it's not crazy expensive either. I think it's like 1500 bucks maybe, something like that. You're talking about the Narishige one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe put the link to the wiki in the chat box when you get a chance, because not everybody's aware of what's where. OK. Great. OK, so recording software. So um, there are uh, at least, I think, three options for recording software. Spike GLX is the one produced by Genelia, um, and it's the one that uh, I've used the most. Um, uh, IBL is using it. Um, it was, it's sort of, in some sense, the official one in the sense that uh, that uh, Tim Harris's group themselves developed it. Um, Open e Fizz uh, is a more community developed one uh, led by a group at Allen Institute. Um, and the, and then, and then Bonsai is a, is a really a community development one. If you, if you're already using Bonsai for something, then you can look into the Bonsai sport. Otherwise, I would definitely pick one of these two. Um, the advantage of Open e Fizz is that it's much easier to um, customize and it's probably going to have a lot more features going forward um, because they have um, they have people working on developing more features for Open eFizz and, and um, I think it's really going to be a great piece of software. Um, it's really it's already a great piece of software. Um, it's going to be even more of a great piece of software in the coming years as, as more and more features get added to it. Um, whereas Spec GLX is really the focus is more on having something that is like simple, gets you your data, um, sort of no nonsense type of thing, um, but really is not extensible in the way that Open EFIS is. Um, so you can use either one. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Spike GLX because, again, that's the one I have the most experience with. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to just spend like 30 seconds um, running through what um, some of the features are so that when you pull it up, you're a little less confused than I was the first time I pulled it up. OK, so I'm just going to quickly um, say what all of these little settings and buttons are. Um, again, just because otherwise you'll spend like a half an hour reading the manual that you didn't have to spend. Um, so sec means um, seconds. Uh, it means the time window of data that you're seeing. So you see these traces, um, they're showing some amount of time, like one second or two seconds worth of data. Uh, sec sets that. Um, and let me say, uh, before I even describe the other ones, all of these settings up here are just about visualization. So if you've clicked enable recording and you're and you're recording, um, changing any of these things does not change the data that goes to the hard drive. It just changes the data that is shown to you while you're recording. Um, so you can feel free to play around with these as you wish um, while the recording is going on. Um, okay, YSCL means Y scale, meaning the vertical, the voltage scaling of the traces. So you get a higher um, uh, uh, the, the spikes look larger, spikes and noise look larger um, when you turn up this number. Um, I guess it's sort of arbitrary units. Um, so you set it to whatever makes it so that the traces look nice to you. Okay, minus bracket T bracket <laughs> means subtract the mean or expected value across time. 
um, in other words, uh, center the traces. So take, so what it's gonna do is each of the traces will have a little offset. It'll sort of average the trace over some time window and subtract that so that they're all centered. Um, in general, there's no reason not to keep this on. You should keep it on. Um, minus bracket S bracket is subtract the mean across space. In other words, to do common average referencing. Um, so this is uh, subtract, so, so averaging across all the channels um, or some group of channels and then subtracting that average value from each channel. And so any noise that's on the reference will get subtracted uh, using this. Um, and you should turn it on by default. Um, in, in particular, the one you should use is the one called glub, uh, so, which is for global, de, uh, global demuxed. Um, I'm not even gonna explain what it is, it doesn't matter, but um, uh, that's the one you should use as default. Um, it's very likely to improve the appearance of your traces um, at least a little bit um, relative to turning it off in this setting. Um, you can turn it off or play with the different options um, to just check sort of what the signal looked like in the raw case. But you can always apply this same common average referencing after you do the recording, uh, before you do spike sorting. Um, and in fact, a version of it, um, which is the same as global all, is what uh, happens in Killisort by default first. Um, and so you really sort of, you don't really have to worry that much if your raw signal with, with it turned off looks bad, because as long as it looks good when you have it turned on, you're gonna be fine. Um, bin max is um, a plotting option. It's just something about this particular way the traces are plotted. You should always have it on. Um, in this screenshot, it's off, but it should be on. Um, there's, I don't think there's any reason not to turn it on. Um, Okay, this one. Nick, just drop. to give you a note, yeah. there's five minutes left. Thanks. Yeah, um, I think I just have. Yeah, I just have a thing about recording stability and breaking probes, so um, that's pretty much it. So look, uh, I will get there. Um, okay, this one shows um, how the data are filtered. Um, whether and 300 dash inf means high pass filtered. It means the filtering is between 300 hertz and infinity. Um, this little button here that looks like sort of four little icicles somehow, um, gives you this view, which shows a color map plot of, um, of a thing that you select here. So like the peak to peak voltage in the action potential band. Um, it shows you a color map view of that across the probe, um, which is a really nice uh, way to see an overview of your probe. Okay, if you change the Y scale or some of the other settings, um, you, you then have to click this green button, um, which will apply that change to all of the channels. If you just if you just change this to say 15, then one of your scales will get one of your channels will get three times as big. But until you click uh, tap button, it won't apply to all the channels. Um, okay, let me go out of order here. So if you pause with this button up here, it'll literally just pause the traces. But again, it will not pause the data going to disk. Um, that data will still be streaming to disk. Um, and so this is a cool way to like really zoom. Like you can set the sec to um, 50 milliseconds, 0.05 and then pause and you'll see the spike weight forms really nicely on all the channels, okay. Um, uh, hover over, so if you hover over one of the traces, so like if, I'm, if I put my mouse here, then down here at the very bottom, you can see there's a little text here. Um, one of these numbers is, the last number actually, is the um, noise level of the trace. It's the total, total uh, RMS standard deviation of the trace um, and that's the number you can look at to see like how noisy the probe is. And the number should be um, definitely less than 15 on all channels if it's not in the brain. If it's in the brain, there will be spikes and other, other neural sources. Therefore, the number will be higher. That's fine. Um, but if it's in saline or outside the brain, it should definitely be less than 15, ideally less than 10. Like you can get like nine values, like nine to 11, um, uh, probably, um, maybe even lower, um, but uh, depending on your noise, um, but it should definitely be less than 15. If it's above 15, you're doing it wrong. Um, the other thing, okay, yeah, okay, good. And then you can right click a channel to either change its gain or to set it as audio output, okay. Um, I'll skip that, we already talked about using multiple probes. Okay, recording stability. Um, so so uh, Marius is gonna talk about an algorithm to solve, uh, to really, really dramatically improve recording stability. Um, so I won't dwell on this. Um, I do do this thing that Sylvia mentioned yesterday, which is um, if you can, if, you're, if your recording site is not all the way at the edge of the skull, um, do retract your probe by about 100 microns after you get to your final, after you get to um, uh, the final insertion depth. And um, I've recently done some sort of quantitative 
version of this test, and this really does work um, to sort of reduce, as, as Sylvia said, reduce some of the tension and uh, and uh, result in a more stable recording. Um, if you're recording in Cortex and you have instability, um, using agar over the um, craniotomy can help stabilize it. Um, or there's this system that we developed that you can email us later for more details about, um, where you actually have this um, little printed honeycomb device that sticks into the craniotomy. Um, you can put the electrode through the holes, but the point is that it, it really um, like sort of pushes down on the brain in the same way that like a glass window in a two-photon imaging uh, experiment would, and uh, allows you to really stabilize cortex a lot more effectively. Um, so that's something that, that we've used some, some um, for specifically stabilizing cortical recordings. Um, the, other, the other thing to do for cortical recordings is make the craniotomy as small as possible. Um, so this was useful, for instance, when we wanted to access a large um, uh, area, three millimeter, this is a three millimeter circle, um, but still have stability when we couldn't make a small craniotomy like that. Okay, last slide, and then I will wrap. I think I have one minute left. Um, so uh, how do you break a probe? Okay, short answer is um, you are going to break a probe. Oh, so first of all, you're going to break a probe. <laughs> okay, secondly, you're going to break a probe when uh, something moves that you don't think is going to move. That's my like rule of thumb. Like what you want to think about is, are things as stable as I think they are? How can I make sure that nothing is going to move around the probe or that the probe itself is not going to move? Um, so for instance, um, uh, one way that I've broken a probe is by, um, uh, well, obviously you're going to break a probe at some point by just like dropping it. The probe moves, you didn't think it was going to move. Um, one way I broke a probe was that I had put some epoxy to connect it to a holder and the epoxy didn't dry as fast as I thought it did and it fell off. Uh, that's a way you break a probe, right? Something moves that you didn't think it would move. Um, you're holding it with a rod and the holder slips and, and rotates and the probe smashes into something. That's the way you break a probe. Um, showing this image that Sylvia showed before, uh, you know, bending is really not a way you break a probe. Um, it's, it would be possible to bend it enough that it snaps, but that's probably really not how you're gonna break a probe. You're gonna break a probe when something moves that you think is not gonna move. And I'm gonna show this video that was alluded to yesterday uh, where we have this mouse and he's grooming and uh, I hope you got that. So there's the probe shank, there's a ground wire. Um, and what moves here that I didn't expect to move was the ground wire. So the mouse grabs it um, and when he lets go, it flings back and smashes the probe shank um, entirely. Um, and so, you know, uh, I could have done a couple of things to solve this. One would have been to use um, a ground wire that was much more rigid so that if the, pro if the mouse did grab it or if it got bumped somehow, that it actually wouldn't have moved around the probe. That would have been a good idea. Um, another option, um, and what we do now, is to like have a sort of barrier here um, that's made out of like a 3D printed plastic piece that we implant. Uh, such that the mouse actually cannot grab up there. And so then that's another way to make sure that this ground wire is not going to move around the probe. Okay, so uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I think that was the last slide I had, yeah.